Let's try this one more time. You can call me Bean. My friends do. I'm going to tell you guys a story, okay? My wife is Chinese. She immigrated to the U.S. to finish her master's degree. And I'll only tell you that because it's relative to the story. To understand what I'm going to try to get at. The other day she said to me, um, she goes, I remember this legend from growing up about a boy and a wolf. I said, okay, well tell me about it. I said, all right. Well, there was this, this boy who was a herder. And he comes running over the hill into the village one day. And he says, you know, there's a wolf. There's a wolf out here. He's trying to get all of my cattle. And, you know, a lot of the men town folk, they grab their sticks and shovels and stuff like that. And they run over the hill and check it out. And there's no wolf. The boy's just sitting over there laughing. A couple of days later, same thing. He comes over the hill and he says, there's a wolf. There's a wolf. The villagers again run over the hill to find nothing. A couple weeks later, the boy comes running back over the hill. There's a wolf! There's a wolf! Nobody does anything. And there really was a wolf this time, and it ate all of his cattle. Now, everybody knows this myth. This is something that I guess has been ingrained in the human existence for a millennia and it has a very poignant meaning. It's very important to all of us. It's something that everybody should learn. Every kid needs to know it. And it's truth and honesty are like the highest ideals. If you don't have your word, you have nothing. I'm going to attempt to be completely honest, just like I am with everything else. Um, I believe as, I forget who said it, a wise man though, if you never lie, you have never have to remember anything. 
and that's a fantastic way to live I think if you are truthful to yourself and others you don't have to worry about remembering lies it's common sense so um, here's my story you can kind of tell where I'm coming from why I'm doing this podcast what I hope to accomplish with it and I hope you enjoy it I was born in a I was raised in the Bible Belt um, born to a Christian conservative family and uh, the men have always been very interested in history and they watched a lot of war movies and stuff growing up um, went to church every Sunday I remember something about uh, my first kind of brush with the uh, I remember the first thing that ever told me not to trust God. It was kind of a multiplication of things. Um, first was when I was younger, I got a virus or an infection of some sort and it was misdiagnosed. And it later developed into epilepsy. And uh, same thing almost happened to my cousin. Same exact thing. Anyway, because of this development, I ended up having to take this medication and take it at the same time as it was 8 o'clock. I'll never forget it. I take it for years. And I remember I went on this church trip. And we were, uh, I don't know, watching some play or something. And the minister took us on this trip, went and got me, and was like, okay, it's time to go take your medicine. Said, All right. He took me to the water fountain got up there and, okay, take your medicine. And I said, no, it's not 8 o'clock, it's up at And the story, he told, he told it in a sermon. He told it in a sermon. When we came back from the trip, I remember what he mentioned. Um, and years later, you know, I haven't been to church in the past, and I've uh, been on the college. Like I go visit the church. Like I went just to see people I haven't seen in a very long time. There, I'm sitting pretty much in the back row. And he tells the story about me not taking the medicine exactly. I want to take the medicine because it wasn't exactly time yet. And he was telling it to me. He was telling it to me, you know, we shouldn't wait for our time. We should, we should make time for ourselves. And basically, I wasn't taking it because the doctor said to take it at 8 o'clock. And I was like, well, he must know what he's talking about. He probably should wait till 8 o'clock to take it. And it's kind of ridicule about following authority really had an impact on me. If it wasn't, you know, correct to follow the directions exactly, maybe nobody... Many times people really know what they're talking about. The reason I had epilepsy at the beginning is because I was misdiagnosed. Uh, anyway, um, that whole thing filled me with all kinds of skepticism. I was fairly nearly baptized into the church at one point, but uh, after thinking about it a very long time, asking a lot of questions and not really getting satisfactory answers, I decided, you know, to continue my search for truth myself and not through the church. I think that was a pretty good decision. Anyway, that kind of curiosity about not trusting authority and everything followed me into the academic life, you know, high school, and like that. I was a Republican pretty much because my parents were. I uh, didn't really believe in any social conservatism. Never have always thought that anybody should do whatever they want as long as it wasn't hurting anyone else. And, you know, I never really did drugs. I didn't drink or anything like that, really. But 
bells were ringing, but it did, and it didn't bother me. Like, it didn't seem like I was forced to do anything. So, I don't really understand why a lot of people had a problem with you know, peer pressure. It wasn't really a factor. And, uh, you know, history was all the time. I always enjoyed the whole American Revolution, the whole of the, the English government. And I always liked the fact that they were fighting because of taxation. The taxes are too much, we have to get rid of the government. And then all of a sudden, you know, once the, the revolution is over, America has their independence, you know, the colonies have their independence at that time, and suddenly taxes are okay. That never made much sense to me. But there were two things I knew I believed in, and they were kind of in line with the That is individual freedom, three things, economic freedom, and second amendment, you know, guns, found that they were important to keep any other right that may yet exist. Rights are supposed to be independent of government. They're not supposed to be something handed out. But as we know, they just kind of take whatever they like. So I've kind of, you know, always thought that Second Amendment was very important to keeping them from doing so. And that's pretty much how I was through high school. I always thought that, you know, I would join the Libertarian Party, but they never have a chance, so there's no point in it. Back when I was still in the whole party politics, the red team, blue team. Um, anyway, it was years later. I was in college, and I met this guy. Became a very good friend of mine, and he introduced me to the outside the mainstream political movements. You know, the other options besides the Republicans and the Democrats. And he introduced me to Alex Jones. This was a pretty big impact on me. Um, I originally, whenever I listened to Alex Jones, I did it because I thought it was funny. I like to hear him rant. And uh, one day, my friend invites me over. He's like, hey, um, Alex Jones is putting out a new movie. It's called Terror Storm. They're showing it online for free. This was back when they used to not stream everything for free all the time on the internet. You can find it anywhere. But, um, okay. Come over and watch it with me. I was like, sure. And I went over there and we watched it. And uh, I took some notes. You know, he's like, don't believe anything this guy says. Just kind of write down stuff and look it up later. And I, I remember specifically the Gulf Tonkin incident. That having a really big impact on me. Because I remember learning in high school how it sent us into Vietnam War. Um, yeah. Anyway, so the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Apparently, it was completely faked. And I hadn't heard about that. It was the first time I heard about that. And I was like, whoa. Looked into it, found out that was completely true. And once you find out something like that's true, it's impossible to really go back. You know, you see things like 9-11 completely different. You see the completely different lens possibilities of the terrible, terrible things government can do. And because of my friend and of course Alex Jones, I ran into the ideas of Ron Paul. And I was like, man, Ron Paul is awesome. He is the only candidate to ever run for office I've actually agreed with. You know, stuff that he said. And I became really involved in helping out with his campaign. You know, locally, putting up signs and stuff. I didn't really work with the campaign Liberty or Ron Paul campaign directly. I kind of did stuff on my own. I worked with the Google local meetup groups too. Okay, but um, anyway, met Ron Paul twice. Uh, first time, this was back, I think it was in 2006, and he was campaigning through South Carolina. And you know, I went with, the whole, with my friend and some other people from the Ron Paul meetup group down there, we set up some signs, heard him speak, got my picture taken with him, got the signs on, it was 
told um, later, back when uh, he was running for president in 2007, you know, later in the campaign, he, uh, back when he did that really awesome debate in South Carolina, he did the debate, and then he left after the debate and went somewhere else and spoke. I was there. And when I went there, before the debate, when we watched it on the TV at this restaurant, I was talking to this guy, and this guy told me, he was there for the same reason about this. It was a politician running for office who we actually agreed with. And it was pretty much how we felt the only chance we had of ever seeing a politician that we agreed with ever been in our lives. You know, we were both very small government constitutional Republicans, I guess, at the time. I don't remember this guy's name, I wish I did. He, uh, he told me about Mises.org. And I wrote it down, put it in my phone, and completely forgot about it. You know, campaign for Ron Paul all through, you know, 2007, 2008 campaign. When that campaign ended, I was kind of looking around like, what now? Because I don't really agree with these other political candidates. I don't want to just jump in my political campaigns. Um, I want to push for something I believe in. So should maybe I should issue and kind of that or something, just to avoid myself from politics completely, because I mean, really don't agree with a lot of politics, and decided the best thing to do. I, I'd go on to, to Mises.org, you know, look at some videos on YouTube or something, figure some stuff out, and after a while of doing that, I decided, hey, I'd read a couple of books, and I picked up, it was um, Our Enemy to State by Albert J. Knox, which is the perfect primer for libertarianism. It makes you really dislike the state. It's, it sets you up for just like, for just hating the state as you should because it's a monster. And um, then I read *For New Liberty* by Murray Rothbard, and that book blew my mind. It showed me that we could be free. It's possible, and I got really into the whole. Austria economic libertarian world, you know, arguing with socialists about how they were wrong and how we could save the world and if we could just get past this whole violent notion. You know, that was the core. It's all the core if everything is the non aggression principle and if humanity can just accept it. And it's something I still believe. That's what ultimately turned me into a voluntarist. But That's a problem I think is is really ingrained with the libertarian movement to this day. And that's uh, they concentrate too much on economics. I completely agree that freedom, free markets is the way to go. But I have no problem with anybody else participating in socialism as long as I don't have to be involved with it. I think focusing on the economics really hurts us as a movement. I think we should be more outreaching to people with different ideas as long as they accept the non-aggression principle. I don't really care if somebody else wants to live under some sort of Marxist-Leninist paradigm I, or, or something else. Like Maybe I'm completely wrong about the whole you know, economic sphere. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter as far as being a libertarian. You should know that you should be able to choose your own path, no matter what, good or bad, make mistakes. It's up to you to kind of accept the consequences. So, um, You know, being a being a, like a Austria economic libertarian, that was that was great. I learned a lot from that. You know, read a lot of stuff, a lot of books, got into a whole bunch of different ideas. Um, the whole time going through this, I was very much agnostic. I believe, still believe, that it's pretty much impossible to prove God. 
there was a thing that there's I think it was Penn Jillette that was talking about agnostics and he was saying that agnostics were just atheists and I completely disagree with that because I'm agnostic I believe that it's impossible to prove that there is a God but I don't rule out the possibility that there is um, in fact I've seen some things and I think there's definitely something beyond the physical and I'd almost say that I'm more Gnostic than agnostic because I believe that spirituality is part of being human and I think that people should be able to experiment with, with that kind of thing they should try to see if they can have a religious experience and that's something else too I think it was Alan Watts who said that Christianity is kind of the antithesis of having a religious experience you're supposed to just believe and it's wrong to even try to, you know to try to meet God on your own terms it's completely wrong and I gotta disagree with that um, something else that had a very very big impact on me years later a couple years later from uh, um, I don't know, like four or five years after I've gotten to old Rothbard and things like that, I'd, I'd already been very much into the whole ethnogenic movement. You know, I've, I've heard, I heard some of um, Robert Anton Wilson's talks, and I, you know, I thought they were interesting and stuff, and I liked them. And I ended up picking up a couple of his books, and one of them in particular, Cosmic Trigger, Final Seekers of the Illuminati, yes, the first one. It had a huge impact on me. It made me even more agnostic about pretty much everything. It also really cemented me to a voluntarist. I guess it kind of pulled me a little bit more to the left. And that might be why I think that the whole focusing on the economic freedom thing is a, it's a problem. We should just focus on the, the freedom thing, you know? We should be able to choose how we do. Now, I know what a lot of you guys are saying, and you're right. Most socialists, anyway, they do not like that idea because if somebody's not participating in their socialism then it doesn't work and that's most likely true in a lot of cases you're going to find the crew to do you know to live the way that you like you're going to find the same people same kind of people with the same kind of ideas you can't force people into it that's really the point you know back when soap was discovered you know, people learned how to clean their hands people just started doing it when they figured out it was a good idea. It wasn't something that people were forced to do. If anything is a good idea, you don't have to force people to do it. They pick it up naturally. It evolves, it changes, it gets better. You think of all kinds of soap we got today. It costs like a dollar. You can go down to Walmart and pick you know, two things of soft hand soap. And that kind of stuff saves people lives, and people don't even think about it. Think about it.
your terrain. Eight. Thank you. 